I want to take you back to kindergarten for a moment. I hope you'll share with me, someone said, oh no, okay. <laughs> I hope you'll share with me your voices and your hands in a song that we all grew up with and we'll sing it together, here we go. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it and you really wanna show it, if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. Very good, boys and girls. I want you now for the next exercise just to quietly ask yourself a question. Are you happy in your work? Whether you're a CEO, an Uber driver, stay-at-home parent, a student here at CMU, an entrepreneur, a nonprofit executive, it doesn't matter. Are you happy in what you do in your work life on a day-to-day -day basis? If you are happy, you're in the minority. This is a survey done by the Gallup organization every year. The first category are thriving at work. 23% of Americans describe themselves as thriving at work. They're doing meaningful work, they feel connected to their colleagues, they feel good about their jobs, 23%. 59% are in what Gallup calls the quiet quitting category. They're filling a seat. They're watching time as the day goes on each day. They feel disconnected, they feel stressed. And finally, taking a step further, is the loud quitting category. These are people who are actively disengaged at work. They're actually, in many cases, trying to harm the organization that they work for. If you add those last two categories together, the 59% and the 18%, we find that three out of four American workers are unhappy in their jobs. In 2018, I started a podcast called Second Act Stories. And I wanted to interview people who'd been in the same job for 10, 15, 25 plus years, and then decided they wanted to do something completely different. They wanted to make a change. So every two weeks, we do a new interview. We interview someone who is pursuing a better life, pursuing a more rewarding life, pursuing a happier life in a second act. My co-host and I have visited 27 different states, and we've recorded and shared their stories on our podcast. Here are a couple of examples of the people we've interviewed. A telephone repairman who now designs women's shoes. Pretty good change. An investment banker who now is a teacher in the New York City public school system. A pharmacist who now is a United Airlines flight attendant. A criminal defense attorney who now is a nature photographer. And my personal favorite, an NFL defensive lineman who is now an opera singer, a Juilliard-trained opera singer. Once we conducted 100 interviews, we tried to look at what are the key things that tie these people together, what are the common threads, and we came up with five key lessons that define the art of the second act. I'm gonna share those with you now. Lesson number one, trauma is often the trigger. So 40% of the people that we've interviewed in these podcasts have been jolted into a second act by way of a traumatic event. A parent or spouse dies, they experience a divorce, there is a global event like September 11th or COVID-19, they experience uh, a health scare. The event causes them to reflect on their lives, to rethink their lives, and to make a change and embark on a second act. Peter Rourke is a good example of this. He was an orthopedic surgeon in Jackson Hole, Wyoming with a thriving practice. He married a woman named Meg. It was his second marriage, Meg's first marriage. And uh, they had a wonderful wedding, beautiful wedding in Hawaii. And two months after the wedding, Meg died of a cardiac arrest. Complete shocks, complete surprise to everyone. Peter was in complete grief. He stopped working, he stopped eating, he moved to his vacation home in Montana and cut himself off from the rest of the world. Now Peter was also an amateur pilot. He had been flying planes since he was in high school. And he got a call one day from a friend who worked for the local ASPCA. And the friend said, we are trying to rescue dogs from kill shelters in California and bring them to loving homes in Wyoming. Would you help us do that? There was a strong personal connection Meg had always been a strong supporter of animal rescue. And their dog, in fact, Dudley, had been a rescue dog. 
So Peter said yes. He took the back seats out of his four-seater plane. He was able to fit two large dogs in big crates in the back or 20 chihuahuas in the back. And he would fly them from Chicago, excuse me, from California to Wyoming. And he started doing this about three or 40 days a week. And as he was doing it, he realized how big the problem actually was. 26, uh, 2.6 million dogs per year are euthanized, a huge number. So he decided it was time to scale up his operation. He mortgaged his house and he bought the large plane you see behind me here. This plane holds 200 dogs or something like 1,000 chihuahuas. <laughs> he started an organization called Dog Is My Co-Pilot. Over the past 10 years, they have saved 25,000 dogs they've rescued. Amazing. It's worth a hand, yes, thank you. Important point about this, trauma was the starting point for Peter and it's the starting point for many people, about 40% of the people we interview. But it isn't a requirement. You can have a second act without a traumatic event. Lesson number two, for inspiration, look back to your childhood. 30% of those we interview go back to something that they enjoyed growing up. It might be acting, baking, music, writing. Something they enjoyed and they reignite their passion for this. Nassim Alakane grew up in Iran. She learned at a very young age Persian cooking from her mother, and she absolutely loved it. She came to the United States to New York City. She was working about 60, 70 hours a week in odd jobs. She was going to school at the same time. She finally bought a photocopy shop with her future husband and worked there. The couple eventually was married, they had twins, and she decided to become a stay-at-home mom. But as her kids were getting older and older, and they needed her less and less, she decided it was time for something else. So she said to her husband one night, I want to start a Persian restaurant in Brooklyn, New York. And her husband said, Nassim, that is the worst possible investment we could make in the world. And Nassim said, I know, but we're doing it anyway. It took seven years to get this restaurant off the ground. It was called Sofre. It opened in 2018. Nassim was 59 years old. It opened to rave reviews in the New York Times, Savour, Food and Wine, the Food Network. The restaurant is consistently booked now weeks in advance. The work is hard. The hours are long, as in any restaurant business. But Nassim loves her second act. She's very happy in it. Lesson number three, there are leapers and there are planners. Everyone we've interviewed fits into one of these two categories. Let's start with the planners. They're about 80% of the overall group we've interviewed. They take a rational approach to a second act. They test the water first. They explore via an internship, a volunteer activity, start up a side hustle, that sort of thing. They test things out first. The leapers are different. They're about 20% of the group. They quit a job with no idea what they're going to do next, and they're a fascinating group of people to interview. Mary Robinson is a leaper. She worked in the IT department at Prudential Financial Insurance back in Newark, New Jersey. It was a great company, a great job, but she, didn't, she felt like a fish out of water in corporate America. One day a friend said to her, Mary, tomorrow morning, go into your office, buy yourself a latte, and walk into your boss's office and hand in your resignation letter. And Mary did exactly that. She told me, I've never had a latte before. It was delicious. <laughs> and then she quit. I asked her what that moment felt like, and she told me, it felt brilliant, like stepping through your fear and into the unknown. I didn't know what I was going to do next, but I knew I was on the right path. Five years later, she launched a nonprofit called Imagine, a center of hope. And this nonprofit works with kids who have lost a parent or lost a sibling, and it helps them deal with their grief. You see, back when Mary was 14 years old, she lost her father to cancer. And that grief was bottled up inside her for years and years and years. And she didn't want another child to experience that kind of pain. Here's the interesting thing about leapers and planners. There is no evidence that one approach is better than the other. Both work equally well. It has more to do with your own DNA and your tolerance of risk, but both approaches work. Lesson number four, expect barriers, lots of them. 
A second act is rarely a straight line. You need to be flexible. You need to be driven. You need to be tenacious. You need to be like Kathy Hine. Let me tell you about Kathy. She's an amazing person. She was a social worker working at a church in Minneapolis. And in her neighborhood where the church was located, she observed the following problem. Someone's car would break down and they didn't have the money to fix it. Lacking the money to fix the car and lacking dependable transportation, they would lose their job. Lacking the income from a regular job, they would become homeless and sometimes forced to live in the car that was broken down. She enrolled in a two-year college, two-year technical college, to become an auto mechanic. Now, if you've ever been to an auto mechanic school, it is filled with testosterone-charged 18-year-old boys who love to fix cars. In walks Kathy, a 38-year-old woman who has her master's in social justice, who's more concerned about, how are the cars feeling today? <laughs> After about two weeks in the course, she went to her instructor and said, I can't do this, this is just too hard. And her instructor said, no, you can do this. You gotta stick with this. I know why you're doing this, and I won't let you quit. So Kathy stuck it out for the next two years. She graduated. There were lots of barriers ahead of her. She had no idea how to run a car repair shop, nothing about nonprofit administration, nothing about fundraising. But she opened the Lyft Garage. It's a nonprofit in Minneapolis, St. Paul, that helps people with car repair for anyone living below the poverty line. And they help hundreds and hundreds of people each year. Amazing story. Number five, our last one. Money is no substitute for purpose. We've done 144 episodes of the Second Act Story podcast. And in 143 cases, the people we've profiled have been significantly happier in their second act. The exception is a man named Steve Paz. Steve always wanted to be a police officer. He joined the Dallas police force in 1992. He felt a strong sense of purpose. He enjoyed the camaraderie of the police force. Uh, he enjoyed helping people. But he was offered a job by a family friend back in 2006. The friend had a growing company and needed extra help. He trusted Steve. Now, Steve didn't know the first thing about the business world. But the pay that he was offered was double what he was making as a police officer. The hours were much better. And he wouldn't be risking his life on a daily basis, which his wife found very appealing. So he took the job. The next three years were really difficult for Steve. He, the, the learning curve was very steep in turn learning about the business world, so that was tough. But more importantly, he felt a tremendous loss of purpose. He didn't realize how much he loved being a cop. He didn't realize why he loved being a cop. He didn't realize how much he loved helping people. And that was all now gone. And he said to me that six word phrase that I shared with you on a slide ago, money is no substitute for purpose. Now today, Steve has rediscovered his purpose via the volunteer work that he does outside of his day job, so that's a good thing. But he told me he misses his work as a police officer every single day. I want to wrap up by telling you about my own second act. So five years ago, I exited the company I owned. My dad had started the company back in 1960. I had been running it for about 30 years. I had two junior partners who were working with me, very, very talented people they were ready to take over the day-to-day -day management of the job. And so I happily was ready to exit. But I didn't know what I wanted to do next. So I decided to try the following. I would try multiple paths at the same time. I had four things I wanted to try. It was sort of like uh, the fail fast method of agile software development. Let's try a bunch of things, let's see what works. So let me go through these four things. I started this podcast that I've told you about, Second Act Stories been incredibly rewarding, very successful. I'll be doing it for a long, long time. I wanted to test my skills as an entre entrepreneur. So I started a, a business called Seven Thank Yous with a friend. We both in invested $10,000. We put in hundreds and hundreds of hours of work and it completely failed, crashed and burned. Didn't work at all. Next, I wanted to try my hand in local politics. Within the community where my wife and I live, there's a tremendous parking problem each summer because we're a beach community. So I created a group called the Better Parking Alliance. 
There were lots of meetings, lots of research, lots of lobbying of public officials. In the end, we made a lot of noise, but we didn't solve the problem. I found I didn't have the stomach for local politics also. Finally, I love running. I've loved running my entire life. And I decided I wanted to become an assistant coach of a high school cross country team. So I connected with a coach who'd been doing this for about 30 years. I worked with him for three years. He taught me everything he knew about cross country running. He was terrific. And two years ago, I felt confident enough to start coaching my own team. This is the team behind me here. It's a uh, elementary school, middle school team. It's been incredibly rewarding. I've enjoyed it a great deal. So I've had success and failure, but I've also had an enormous surprise. 17 months ago, my wife's cousin died of cancer. She was a single mom and she had a 10 year old daughter. And my wife and I offered to adopt and raise her daughter. So we now have a 39 year old son, a 31 year old son, and, a 10 -year -old, and an 11 year old daughter now. This is her picture with me here. She is going to her first father daughter dance at the age of 11. I'm going to my first father-daughter dance at the age of 62. I know you're clapping because you can't believe I'm 62. <laughs> Adopting a daughter so late in, in life has been a really, a whirlwind experience for my wife and I, and it's probably the subject of another TED Talk another day. But I'll just say we feel incredibly blessed, blessed to have this wonderful girl in our life. So let's go back to you. Are you happy at work? If you're in the thriving at work category, I hear some people saying yes, that's great. I hope you continue to stay in that category and continue to do amazing work. But if you find yourself in the quiet quitting or the loud quitting phase, it's time to explore a change. It's time to do something different. It's time for a second act. So I wanna leave you with another song I'll do the singing this time, you just clap. I've changed the words so you don't know it, here we go. If you're unhappy and you know it, make a change. If you're unhappy and you know it, make a change. If you're unhappy and you know it, to yourself you really owe it. If you're unhappy and you know it, make a change. Thank you very much. Thank you to TEDx, thank you.